engaged. Okay, so it's loading here. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got notification that it's on. All right, so welcome everyone to uh, the International Association for Political Science Students webinar on SDG 18, um, Space Politics. I'm Justin Patrick, president of IEPS, and I'm here uh, with my co-host, Rory Monshine, um, IEPS director of civic engagement and strategic uh, diplomacy. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, three um, very qualified um, speakers uh, on this topic. So our first um, speaker is um, Char Monter, a 21-year-old student studying global project and change management. Um, she became a founder of SG, a co-founder of SDG 18 Space for All, an initiative focused on ensuring the sustainable use of outer space so that all of humanity can equally benefit. To ensure this, um, SDG 18 Space for All believes that space should have a spot on the UN global agenda. Her interest in space began with the overview effect to bring the topic of space closer to people and create a collective sense of responsibility. She is currently also focusing on space education for young children and helps um, write a three-part lecture series involving art, science, and sustainability uh, to teach for space. Next, um, Alexander Stommels is president of Circle of Sustainable Europe, the leading European umbrella NGO in Brussels. He has shaped um, this organization's strategic reorientation and developed new business opportunities combined with current and future environmental sustainability projects. Besides that, um, Alexander is an accredited lobbyist in the European Parliament and expert of the World uh, Economic Forum. Further recognized as a, as a NASA solver and global matchmaker, he has been selected as one of the 50 young masterminders of the Michael um, Polarczyk Mastermind Academy and voted as one of, of the 200 most sustainable young leaders in the Netherlands between 2017 and 2020. He focuses his philanthropy on global matchmaking. Alexander holds a supervisor degree in business administration and management from Maastricht University School of Business and Economics. And we have Jacob uh, Gentala is a jack of all trades, very versatile in different areas of knowledge, ranging from new technologies to social sciences. However, his passions lie in politics, international relations and civic empowerment. Jacob has helped and developed multiple projects that give a voice to young people in policymaking. He's an active element of the International Civil Society. He has led different youth-led civil organizations over the years. In um, a circle of sustainable Europe, uh, Jacob has helped navigate the complexity of corridors of power in Brussels and builds perspectives across the Atlantic. He studied uh, political science, European law, public policy, and human development. So with that, I'm going to hand it off um, to my co-host, uh, Rory. Thank you so much. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce these panelists. And Kiara, if you could please share your presentation and discuss um, some of the important issues that underlie space politics. Yes. Thank you so much for the great introduction. And I think my presentation is coming up now. Yes, perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you so much uh, to both you and, just, you and Justin for inviting me to this event. It's really an honor to be here. And I wanted to use this opportunity to talk a bit more about uh, the initiative that I'm a part of, which is SDG 18 Space for All. Uh, as we started as a student group uh, working on a university project who recognized the importance of having space on a global agenda as an SDG. Uh, and I wanted to talk you through our ideas right now. So can I have the next slide? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, oh, no. <laughs> um, so we realized that uh, the sustainable uses of outer space is very important. And I wanted to kind of highlight why an extra SDG is necessary. 
So after spending a lot of time researching this, I could probably talk about this reasoning for hours, but I will keep it short. So the sustainable development goals highlight our responsibilities as humans towards a sustainable planet. However, what we realized is that these global goals seem to understand the planet Earth as an isolated entity and forget our dependence on and responsibility towards the whole system that we are a part of. And as the public and private interest in the quest for exploration and use of outer space increases, these issues have to be addressed right now. Most striking factors that we found to hinder this development was a lack of awareness and knowledge. And by spreading the word and making people aware of certain issues, they are more likely to accept and embrace change for a better future. Because we need to realize our orbit is definitely not infinite and space debris poses a huge threat to this environment. We put so many amazing technological advancements into space, but some of them are just not functioning. And even tiny pieces of debris can cause so much damage to our delicate satellites and to the International Space Station. So the protection of outer space is incredibly crucial for activities that go beyond what one might first think. It is important for policies and sectors that support socioeconomic development, public safety, public health, showing that we cannot reach these first 17 sustainable development goals without harnessing space properly. Uh, unfortunately, we found out that not a lot of people know this, and I want to explain how by raising awareness and knowledge, we can plan on creating societal value for all. So in this slide, you see that it is important to uh, both the general public and decision makers to understand that space activities bring along a lot of benefits. So right now, what we see is that the public support for space activities is not that strong, and this is again strongly connected to a lack of knowledge and awareness. The public needs to be educated on how important space actually is. And UN involvements in space as more of a prominent aspect to the global agenda does not just help to achieve that all SDGs are met, but it also helps to generate public support, which politicians can then use to put money towards responsible space activities. Governments need to have the political will to explore space and to spend money on this, but this will only be created once the general public also advocates for it. This is an example that you could see in developing countries, where of course there are very vital agenda points that the government want to put their money towards. But there is not really an understanding on a public level that if you, for example, have a satellite in space, you can support agricultural activities and also benefit the country that way. Next slide, please. Secondly, communities are often unaware that the whole world has access to a lot of free space tools and data. And this open access is very important since as we have discussed, the usage of space can be beneficial to all of society. The awareness uh, that this exists needs to be given to everyone. Next slide, please. Thirdly, it is not only that the community communities are often unaware that these free tools and data exist. They also don't really have the knowledge about how to harness this properly. The benefits of space should be brought to all. So capacity building is very vital. With this know-how, communities are empowered to reap all the benefits from space activities. Next slide, please. So with our initiative, uh, I've just touched upon uh, a short explanation of how important outer space is for our, for our environment here, but also for the environment out there. So we have started to set up some SDG targets, uh, which we got some help on writing to try and cover all bases. And you see that one of these is also concerning space law. Because what is very detrimental is that the last treaties and principles on space law were set up in 1996. It's a long time ago, considering all the technological advancements we have made thus far. So it's vital that these laws are updated. Next slide, please. What became evident for us as well is that there's a high importance for youth engagement in this field of civic action. And throughout our journey with creating SDG 18, it became so clear that it is possible to create action and change, even if you're not really an expert in this field from the beginning. And since space is our past, our present and our future, we need to be mindful and recognize what is happening and help towards protecting that space that we need. 
So for our initiative, our vision is to ensure the sustainable use of outer space so that all of humanity can equally benefit. And we want to do this by creating more awareness about the importance of outer space protection in order for it to be more prominently included on this global agenda. To achieve this, we have the strategy to advocate for an extra SDG on space protection and sustainability, advocate for more binding legal agreements and create awareness amongst and connecting different sectors. So it is very important for us to take on a more multidisciplinary approach. Next slide. Thank you. So if you're interested, this is how you can get in touch. Um, it would be great to hear from you and to hear your ideas. And thank you for listening. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chiara. And um, I'm sure we'll have lots of uh, exciting comments uh, on our stream here. I believe that um, Alexander also has a presentation. So I guess we can um, set that up. Um, I guess in the meantime, does anyone have any other points they would like to share as I set up this presentation? Okay, Alexander, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Like you see on the picture, it's straight away in the situation of COVID-19. So to say it really, really painfully uh, that COSE uh, started officially on March this year. Uh, so it was really a surprise that we got uh, automatically everything on the problems and finding solutions and topics that we can do. But uh, without giving up, we found a lot of possibilities uh, doing a lot of digital ways. So, uh, but besides of this uh, start point, COSE is uh, of, uh, <clears throat> developed since last two years. Uh, besides of me and other colleagues, uh, we had some really nice questions got by uh, the climate reality uh, event we were invited. We spoke with global shapers and other people around the world about what is possible to do. And uh, in the same time, uh, besides of some nice projects, we got requests to develop something nice in Brussels to connect the bottom up and top down mentality and uh, uh, everything what's possible in the current and future uh, possibilities in, in the sustainability. Uh, we started in focusing on water <coughs> and SDGs. But uh, eventually we got so much uh, other uh, requests and chances that we were focused on more than that. But uh, like I said, our unlucky part was that we wanted to start in March uh, and it went a little bit in surprises, uh, in surprise way uh, better than expected, but it was not uh, prepared for it. Uh, beside of me, uh, I have also Jacob at my side. Uh, he will also uh, can uh, add some points if he have, have uh, Jacob. Well, maybe we should touch a little bit. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, maybe we should touch upon actually the projects that we are currently running as Circle of Sustainable Europe. Because besides uh, no projects that relate uh, strictly to no, no water, actually here life in the oceans, also no, we are very much focused on no, no civic affairs and future of Europe as uh, our origin is on European continent. And also we are you know, doing uh, quite a lot of projects that relate to international security and future of our planet. Uh, that's why uh, uh, we are today here to talk about uh, our future uh, in the space. And together with Kiara, we have partnered up uh, to uh, set up more fair representation of young people when it comes to you know, space affairs. And yes. we will be talking a little bit more about that during the you know, panel. Yes. Uh, Cosé has indeed also uh, doing a lot of great celebration like the World Space Week and a NASA hackathon in the Netherlands. But uh, since uh, several months, we have really nice requests. It's a, it's a little surprise for at the end, but we want to develop an engagement uh, forum for youth uh, 
uh, be between youth and uh, UNOSA. So, uh, uh, but that is for the end. Uh, next slide. <laughs> Or is, is it not working? <laughs> yeah, thank you. These are the people that we had uh, starting from this beginning of the year. Like you see, you see uh, many different kind of uh, personality, but uh, uh, we started in this kind of way because we wanted not to do it alone from one country. And uh, we have already started with some Benelux uh, projects from ocean and from space to connect Netherlands, Luxembourg and, and Belgium together and some knowledge between youth, some topics and uh, the universities uh, to the government, but it's still starting. Everything is new digital. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we have uh, uh, people like Dennis who can good present, uh, looks really, really holy, but he's really uh, has his own personality. Uh, Ramon is uh, more like a, a good writer and knows how to uh, communicate in the right language uh, when it's needed. Uh, and if you speak about uh, Lucy, who's really uh, with knowledge about uh, uh, what's important uh, uh, at the ocean, but also with sustainability. Uh, Jacob uh, is really good at some topics of European base, but also starting with connection to America. And Stefano is really active in, in his home country, Italy, where he's also developing more progress in it. So uh, it was a little start idea, but it's really progressing and we want to inform and connect uh, as much umbrella organizations and uh, uh, to connect a really a big message for the current situation. Next slide. Well, uh, here you can see some examples. Uh, uh, on the left, you can see how uh, kind of discussions we, we have. Uh, sometimes it's really li like uh, it, how it works normally. You have a meeting with people with good dresses on and who have already worked really many years on different kinds of topics. But it's really nice that you have so much, many kind of different kind of generations with the same idea. I want to focus on helping and engaging and giving a stage to the youth and to the elderly in the same way, instead of thinking about each other and speaking about each other. Um, below, you see how we tried uh, to connect uh, in a combination of being social with a good feeling and having masks on. It's not really comfortable, but uh, uh, it's really difficult. We can say it fair. But uh, we are still trying to have a happy conversation, uh, have security with it. And uh, in the same time, it's really good to have impressions like uh, my of six years ago when first time I went to the parliament. Whole empty personal uh, a tour by a person that I know. And I saw that uh, the parliament can also be a, a nice empty building. It's not always really important. So this was my impression. I. Uh, uh, I think that others also have some experience of it, but uh, uh, next slide. <laughs> and uh, this is a little example what I, I've already done for some years from now. Uh, uh, some uh, Erasmus youth exchanges. Uh, 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 around six years ago, I participated by myself because I saw which kind of possibilities uh, are uh, around Europe uh, to participate and uh, learn some topics. So I went to a lot of places, got a lot of youth passes, but at the same time, uh, found a lot of friends, a lot of NGOs and a lot of knowledge and trust and respect to organize my own youth exchanges. So I did many of them. This is one example that we did, uh, one of the biggest we did one uh, project last year, not simply one um, exchange, but two exchanges at the same time. So uh, first at the Netherlands and then in Poland. And we had a really nice uh, experience of having uh, East uh, uh, European uh, uh, young uh, 
students and young professionals who engage themselves what's possible with sustainability and what they can do in their own uh, country with uh, their topics. And then we, we came uh, to the Poland to see the examples and the possibilities what uh, we uh, not have expected from the Net Netherlands perspective, but at the same time also with other uh, countries of uh, the e uh, from the West and others, so they can see how it is in different kind of places in Europe. Uh, and the most uh, nice uh, Erasmus Plus uh, project that I've experienced, uh, I was also co-organizer of it. It was the topic debates for youth. We had a, a, a training last year where uh, youth were learning how they can speak uh, in different kind of perspective. We trained uh, youth for uh, engage themselves from the street view, how they can speak at the street with people till Oxford degree. So it was really nice to experience them with a lot of teachers. We invited also some teachers, trainers from our, a lot of different kinds of ways. And uh, it was really nice to give students the chance in around 12 days learning different kind of uh, trainings and exchange so they can understand how much different kind of coaches they are and at the same time how they need to speak sometimes. Sometimes you, you, you is uh, already enough if you say a nice question or a nice word instead of a long story like I, what I'm doing. Uh, next, uh, I think this is the last, uh, one of the last slides, if I'm right. Okay, it's, uh, it's, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, it's uh, coming to an end. If you're interested and you want to start around yourself or a bigger impact, uh, you can seriously connect me or Jacob because we are trying uh, to uh, scaling up, not doing it alone, always together. And uh, we are not the uh, wise uh, wizards or the wise uh, masters who can uh, say all the answers straight away. But we know uh, a lot of people, a lot of organizations. I'm also connected uh, with a lot of space agencies. And uh, uh, like uh, I said uh, at, uh, before, we, we are developing a really nice United Nations uh, project uh, where we try to connect youth engagement with UNOSA. And uh, I, say, I can uh, say, say that it's already good, uh, um, um, good development around the world. Maybe you know Space Generation Advisory Council. I can really recommend you what they're doing. But I find it also fair that uh, uh, there will be also some youth representatives who will be speaking with UNOSA and also some more possibilities by connecting uh, uh, UNOSA, uh, the project's activities uh, from UNOSA to youth generations. But this is uh, for another time. <laughs> okay, thank you for the time. And uh, this was my presentation. <laughs> uh, Jacob has nothing to say. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. <laughs> um, I am monitoring the live chat. And by the way, for everybody that is watching, please feel free to write down your thoughts and tell us what you think. We are conducting this as a UN 75 consultation. So we're going to be asking you guys and we're going to be making this more interactive so we can really think about ways to build back better. So far in the comments, we found that people would like to see this expand outside of Europe. We've had specific comments about Latin America and how you guys can promote this work in that region because somebody was saying that there's not a lot of knowledge about this. Um, there are people that would like more information about this as well. And I guess something that we'll do towards the end of this is to really take uh, as many questions as we can. Our panelists have definitely and generously agreed to um, really engage with you because these are important topics. But I guess let's start on the panel portion Justin, if you could switch to panel view so we could see all of our amazing panelists. Sure. Then let's get this started. So as we're doing that, I will begin with the first question. How does space help climate action for SDG 13? Because we talk about the, the importance of protecting Earth, but how do we think about it in a more, um, in a more uh, broader sense? How does that apply to space? Because there's a lot of action right now on climate. There's a lot of focus on the climate, but how do we incorporate some of that energy into some of the work that you're doing? Well, I what think I can Sorry, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. I think that can kind of be seen twofold because of course we have a lot of work to be done here on earth and we need to have a focus on that and it is an, a sustainable development goal, but what 
needs to be more clear and more prominent is how much space technology is actually helping us with this. So when it comes to, to this SDG 13, space technology plays a central role in climate change monitoring, weather forecasting, disaster management, and search and rescue operations. And like above that, you, space technology in this image from satellites is so vital uh, to understand what is happening on our Earth. So for example, uh, we cannot calculate the thickness of the ice layers on the poles without satellite images. So when we look from our perspective here on Earth, we need space in order to focus on this climate action that we're taking. But we also need to recognize that we are part of something bigger and that it's not just Earth and then there's space, but that we are actually in space and that there are certain actions, especially environmental issues facing space right now that we also need to focus on. A very prominent one of that is space debris and its disastrous possibility to grow exponentially. So I think those are two very important things that really need a bit more awareness to recognize like how close space actually is when it comes to climate action. Yes, and at the same time, uh, we all can think that we are astronauts of Earth. You maybe have heard when you were at school, the teacher or the, uh, the people around you were saying, why do we need to think our, out of space? We are also living on our planet. So uh, indeed, what Kia said about satellites, we have Earth, Observa Earth Observation Program, Copernicus Program, so much of possibilities to get knowledge to, to how to use data, how to acknowledge what is uh, really important, uh, what the Netherlands and Europe did, even in Australia, they found it really nice about the scanning with the satellites because you know, uh, oh, um, how, uh, in around half year ago, all these fires around Europe and around the world is really painfully to experience, but it's really important to see it also uh, by the view. So it's also uh, uh, that we know how, uh, when it's need to be uh, going further because uh, beside of the water, the wind, uh, all these uh, biggest, uh, biggest uh, tornadoes and uh, earthquakes that can happen is really good to be prepared. And it's better to do it with a satellite view than with our own eyes. So that is really good. And in the same time, uh, a lot of things that it's be prepared and collected and finding out at Mars or at the moon. Uh, and of course, we will be learning on, on, on our Earth. And uh, a lot of other projects uh, ACE and NASA are doing. They're trying better mobility, better uh, development. And uh, uh, we as human being, indeed, will also have needed uh, help from robots and a lot of things. But uh, why not uh, be happy and also not uh, get the knowledge of the satellites instead of giving the knowledge to the satellites? So uh, that is uh, my adding point. And uh, uh, also a question why? Because it's already a big impact topic point by UNOS itself. UNOS had organized in begin, begin September a really important symposium uh, about how they can uh, uh, develop space applications for SDG 13. So it's already, do, uh, it's already going on with a lot of uh, scientists, a lot of countries, and uh, instead of that, we asking why do we and uh, why do we need to do it with each other? We can ask with them, and they can give us answers and reasons. So we we know instead of that, we will be simply already filling in all this information around us. Because being fair, we are we are uh, in around uh, 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 one fifth of of our age of of our life, and it's not fair that we are already filling in now really nice chances that are already pre getting prepared from the last centuries for, uh, for, uh, for us now to skip that because we find it not really interesting. But it's, it's uh, all uh, sometimes only because of the language. Uh, if you know the quote of Einstein, if you cannot explain to, uh, if a professor cannot explain to your child, you cannot uh, explain to others. So it's really important that you understand uh, if you have an idea that you need to have a lot of uh, experience and knowledge, how you need to explain to others. Because if, if some people will be not listening to a debate or lecture for one hour, they want a one answer in one uh, sentence. So, uh, uh, Jacob, do you have something for this also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, I will take it over from here. Uh, when we are talking about space, 
mankind has been looking to the stars since uh, ancient times. Well, pretty much the zodiac, all the mythology uh, were always central around the stars. Uh, the stars and astrology, science fiction, this is something that always is uh, inspiring us to look uh, to the future. So basically, it's not only the fact that, uh, as Chiara already mentioned before, uh, space technology is central for climate change and uh, monitoring some 50% uh, of different indicators uh, when it comes to climate change, from biodiversity uh, to agriculture, uh, depth of uh, ice caps, uh, or monitoring ozone layer. Uh, or CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Uh, there is one more thing that uh, we also should remember that is uh, all of us believe that the uh, future of our species lies among the stars. It's just not Earth that we believe is our homeward, but it's just a piece of rock that we are flying on. And Earth itself is just one big spaceship that we should uh, keep tidy. So before we expand uh, to other uh, uh, planets, other solar systems, etc., first we should not uh, take care of our uh, own backyard and then start uh, progressing uh, towards the future. But to add to that, sorry, the, the problem is, which we are facing right now, is that we are already expanding to the universe. We are going into space. So the action of first cleaning up our own backyard and then looking out, it's already too late for that to some extent. So we have to realize what we're already doing in space as well and make sure we're cleaning up there. Why not both? <laughs> I love that too, because it's so important to have context, right? And think about how not just how we're also about the importance of not only taking care of our own home, but also taking care of everything around us, that we're not just one isolated planet. And that's something that's really interesting that's coming up on the comments as well, because people are asking what you mean by sustainability and how that applies into this context. But also some of the comments are regarding how you can definitely mobilize some of this energy on climate action, because we're starting to see that energy among youth and how you can get them just as passionate about space politics. So if you don't mind discussing some of those themes as well. Well, if I experience how much of uh, chances you can uh, get by yourself if you knock at the door, uh, I got uh, simply by my own interest about Earth Observation uh, Platform two uh, years ago by ASA. I went to the open day, uh, I asked questions, I got uh, answers in return. I was really uh, 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 happy to experience that a lot of people who were working there also living around me. So they are not somewhere that nobody is co uh, connected with. They are living, they're also human. They also have already a lot of uh, experience. So uh, if you have questions by your own, and you feel around yourself, okay, uh, they are not doing anything with it. Maybe you can start your own uh, uh, adventure with a request, like a project, instead of uh, going around and say, what, why are you not doing this? Just asking questions that you find gaps in. So that is how I started some years ago. Uh, and what I found out that uh, no, no matter where, no matter what, almost everyone was open to discuss because I because I not I'm uh, I never came with hello I'm really important I can help you or I need to help you I came always made to mentality hi how are you uh, uh, with interest and also respect uh, by knowing their website knowing their past history so if you want to go to NASA and ASA do your homework read something about their history, uh, uh, call them, mail them, uh, visit them, and they just want to be uh, uh, helping you because I got so much messages back that not so many youth are calling them. So if you know how much NASA agencies there are, offices, you, you get, I did it in one year, really nice people who working there. Uh, ASA and other agencies, there are so much of agencies. So um, if you are like in from uh, Germany and you like uh, you like JAXA, the working of uh, in Japan agency, don't be uh, share, just uh, uh, contact them because they are, are doing a lot of parts. 
but I was more, more impressed when I saw what the Space Generation Advisory Council was doing. Um, you maybe have heard about them. The short call is GAC. They organize each year uh, now a competition called Youth Competition together with United Nations, the uh, or NOSA special competition with an idea how it can be developed. But in the same time, the, the questions about uh, uh, should we add an SDG, SDG 80 or should we add space in all the other uh, SDGs is really interesting because uh, like COVID-19 is doing, everything is go, going for later. And uh, like the quote, see you later allig alligator, it's, it's like, if you want to find it, go to Africa or the places, but in your own country, if you're not looking for it, you will not find it. So the, I, uh, the, from the past idea, if you get a great, a good grade uh, without good network, you have already a problem because uh, if you look around you about the, your excellence, it's, it's already not only about how good you are, but in which kind of moment with how much of students and how much of places you try to engage yourself in it. So you start as a student with groups and ideas, you, you find your own interest. And at the same time, you find a good surprise when you are done and you want to work that uh, there's not enough places and jobs to do. So instead of dreaming and hoping and uh, complaining about how bad it is everywhere, uh, prepare yourself with engaging with the network, not simply uh, do everything free, like, hello, I want to help you free. If you want, I give you my hand and you give me your pinky. No, try to engage equally. So if you want to help, say it also fairly, I'm not doing it for the money, but I'm doing it for knowledge and uh, trust. So do not forget my name in the in the document, do not forget because uh, it's it's sometimes also not fair if you do a research project and somebody else is uh, is going away with the copy paste of it. Try to uh, add it already in practice before beside of putting on paper because if you put it on paper instead of practice, is 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 uh, not only uh, that people can steal it faster or uh, copy paste it faster if you do it in practice environment, people around you know that you organize that. And if you are smart, you organize topics that nobody else is speaking about and or if invite all these organizations who are concurrents of each other, invite them together to discuss. You have already something that is really original because you get engagement of organization who only thinking about uh, some other uh, perspective than working together in the same time. Uh, and uh, our uh, perspective is so it, it started uh, with simply topics like culture, sustainability in your own uh, uh, um, house or in your own city and by do it by your own to uh, how we can engage space in, in so kind of way that engineers, because I saw also some question of engineers, there are so much of possibilities by cooperation by current space engineers with a lot of artists and really uh, famous uh, ac actors because we have we've all uh, something original in us and instead of uh, selling it or putting it sometimes on the internet you can do so great uh, cooperation formula parts but you need to make this uh, fire going on in your own uh, uh, starting uh, perspective instead of okay he will uh, he will get the fire i get the lucifer and he will be uh, the fireman when we going bad so you ne need to take also the responsibility afterwards it's incredibly important to think about how local really is global and how global is like even more um, broad than we thought. And it's actually really interesting because some of the comments that we're getting is about multilateralism. And I think that that's, incredibly, that's an incredibly important theme, especially as we're approaching UN 75, which is an opportunity to really build back better and think about ways that countries can cooperate with each other and what better way to cooperate than space. So one of the questions that we got, and, I'm, and I think that it's important to address it because it is something that's related to one of the themes that you discussed is how will Brexit affect any European collaborations on sustainability? And I guess we can even broaden that to um, cooperation on space politics, if you would like to go into that. 
Uh, well, about Brexit, uh, hopefully it's not uh, going also to other European member states because uh, if you had uh, experience uh, about uh, 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 from the Netherlands, a famous uh, political person with white hair, Wilders, was also screaming about that some uh, when Brexit uh, was uh, uh, developed. Uh, it's really important to uh, also be involved and also try to engage it because if you see like uh, like now on the social media, it's like not normal. How much of organization? How mo- even if you go to uh, the governmental parts, organization, universities, everybody is doing digital. You already uh, collapse in so much of chances and choices that you cannot. Uh, choose on, uh, already cannot choose for yourself so uh, it's really difficult also then to also choose it for others so at the biggest uh, importance for now is if you want to discuss this kind of situations uh, uh, Brexit itself need to be more clear because uh, it's really difficult to, to, to experience my sister is living also in UK and experience what happenings uh, happening there uh, at some places is really well, at some places are not really well, but uh, it's uh, need to be good communicated with uh, European Union and also uh, other topics. So, uh, from my side. Right. Does anybody want to add? Well, maybe I will add a little bit about multilateralism since uh, I am probably the most political of our panelists today. So uh, first, when we are talking about multilateralism, uh, technically entire space cooperation is based in multilateralism because uh, the 1967 uh, Treaty of Outer Space and following it uh, in the tre- Moon Treaty uh, generally base everything in international law. So uh, technically states uh, are limited to cooperation with each other. And when we are talking also about issues relating to you know, sovereignty and uh, stuff like sustainability and how Brexit will uh, affect everything, the biggest problem with uh, Brexit is if it will be deal or no deal uh, agreement. And this will you know, hugely impact uh, uh, certain European agreements uh, on that how uh, UK will be treated uh, according uh, uh, to uh, Paris Treaty. Either they will be part of European quota system on uh, uh, emissions or they will be counting separately. So that is a very important issue that uh, is supposed to, uh, that we have to address over here because this remains as a big unknown. Uh, another problem when we are talking about space and sustainability is the issue of debris that Chiara hinted on over here you know, a couple of times. Uh, the debris is getting exponentially uh, bigger and bigger, and there are only certain orbits that allow for uh, better access to outer space. So sooner or later, uh, the debris will get big enough that it will you now create problem that we won't be able to launch any more satellites or space shuttles because the debris in outer space, even if it's like five millimeter object that is hurling at the speed of 20, 30,000 kilometers per hour, uh, can make so much damage that pretty much it can disable entire space station or just uh, derail the satellite from the orbit. So we should remember that when we are you know, doing something in the outer space, we have to keep it clean. So one of the questions that somebody asked in the live in the live uh, audience wanted to, this person wanted to know if there are any international documentation projects with inputs from all countries about some of these issues, and what cooperation has there already been? And I guess I would expand that a little bit because as we're starting to see, a lot of countries are focused on unilateralism. And I guess, how do we reinvigorate that sense of multilateralism on this particular topic? Just one point to the multilateralism that I'd like to also mention is that there is a high need for capacity building because of course we want to have that multilateralism and that cooperation. But what we do see is that there are certain countries and certain space agencies that of course have 
more of the resources and more of the capabilities to go further. But if we want to advocate for a space for all and really get everybody on, on board, we need to make sure that the capacities in all countries are there so that they can all benefit equally from space. And that is, I think, still a big challenge right now. Yes, and at the same time, you maybe acknowledge the new Artemis Dakur agreement from NASA last week. Last uh, week, uh, also, ASA had uh, signed it up. Uh, I saw also some uh, uh, requests why we're not answering for all the uh, other agencies. Well, um, we try uh, to inform you uh, what we experience and we are not, uh, we do not want to forget anybody here. So it's a question, let us know. Uh, but if you look at uh, how much of data, if you go to NASA website or information, they're sharing a lot. I found so much of old projects and all, uh, you, uh, they're giving data freely. So if you want to learn yourself about space studies, uh, just knock on the door of a space agency and ask about your question. You can get so much in return. Uh, I, uh, I can also share if people ask questions, the links information that I got, but it's really nice to see how much of project they were developed and how much of cooperation are becoming because you maybe know about uh, the Cold War between America and Russia uh, moment. It's really nice to see how NASA is now cooperating with ASA and also already speaking with JAXA and also Roscosmos. So um, it's, not, uh, it's not only uh, that you cannot find it, it's also about uh, the reason and with whom you want to find it. So try also, uh, instead of looking on the internet, just uh, uh, a cold space agency and tr uh, try to acknowledge what they can share with you uh, so you can make further steps in, on, uh, by on, uh, instead of looking on the internet for the information. Yeah. Uh, I will add something here uh, to the original question because Rory, I remember you asked uh, how we can enforce cooperation in uh, terms of space. So uh, the original space treaty that has been uh, no, signed by relative majority of the countries on the planet uh, is enforcing uh, that uh, every single country on the planet is uh, entitled to peaceful uh, and to uh, a peaceful and more prosperous you know, exploration of uh, outer space, uh, despite of its you know, capacity. So if they want to join and uh, start exploring outer space, uh, this is their right, because the uh, 1967 uh, Space Treaty uh, defines it in the base of in international law and UN Charter, which technically uh, is binding for all countries of, you know, on the planet as part of their own legislation. So technically, whenever we still have like a lot of issues, say concerning uh, the new arms race going on you know, between uh, Russia, China, France, and uh, USA, in uh, regards to building their own space capacities, uh, they could find themselves in breach of uh, this particular treaty. However, this treaty doesn't really define uh, what is the problem with uh, uh, placing different armaments around the orbit because it only talks about weapons of mass destruction. So if somebody will want to place a, a bunch of Marines and drop them from the orbit, be my guest, you can do that. That's not illegal. But uh, uh, going back to the question of uh, sharing technologies and uh, doing cooperation, uh, the treaty is also enforcing that people will be doing uh, the collaboration between each other. And there's a lot of scientific collaboration going on in terms of uh, scientific records, so in terms of astronomy, physics, astrophysics, uh, uh, exobiology, uh, and uh, different uh, areas of knowledge, as well as you know, sustainability. However, this is something that is not really highlighted by the media. And from the international point of view, uh, there are not that many treaties that are really binding because like uh, when we are talking about UNOSA, so United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, uh, this UN body has only 24 member states. So out of over 190. So there's still a lot that needs to be done in this discipline. And this is something that we should highlight over here. We are just chartering new space 
and uh, probing what can be done and uh, what is impossible at this stage. But uh, as people say, uh, the horizon or the sky is the limit. Actually, there is no sky because the limit is somewhere out there. So I guess one question would be, do you have an example of documentation of like the countries that are coming together? What is one resource, just super quick, because I want to go into some of the other questions, but if you have one like off the top of your head. Okay, like the best way to find an, uh, documentation regarding outer space, or you can just simply go to UNOSA website. So that's uh, UN uh, double O S A dot org. And over there, you will see you know, space for SDGs or our work. And over there, you can find a lot of very important resources on that what's currently going on in terms of uh, space affairs and uh, space law. So if you want so to read that, yeah, if you want to read more about that, you can find it on that website. Also, there is mentioned SGAC, so Space Generation Advisory uh, Council, and that's SGAC. Uh, dot org perfect yes. and that's a great place for students to start right because a lot of students yes. are asking on the chat how they can like get their feet wet in these topics well, uh, besides of SGAC, uh, we have a nice initiative called space influencers you can find it out we're just starting and we want to give everybody a chance to engage uh, our mission to connect youth with uh, space experts at the current uh, floor uh, but at the same time, you can look at uh, really uh, by the first step, like uh, ASA has developed new ASA courses and masterclasses. Just check them out on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, follow the space agencies and you find that they are sharing a lot of new things. Masterclass is really nice. They give you training about how they're communicating in their own view and what kind of topics. But if you want to start with uh, really simple steps, uh, ACE and NASA are doing training from the age of six till the age of uh, 14, 14, and they giving youth already learning points how they can engage themselves with space. So you can you can easily train yourself from the beginning if you find it really interesting to see what young children are learning from this moment of, and it's really nice. Thank because I think yeah. also it's it's very easy to get into the sector and to get more information. So also for me personally, I first really started working in the field of outer space about a year ago. And before that, I didn't really have a connection either. But the whole like sector is very open. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to people and you can definitely have very good conversations. And the resources that Alexander has mentioned are also, yeah, they're at your disposal. They're very easy to find and to understand as well. So it's it's quite easy to get in touch. You just have to be willing to look for that information. And that's a really good point as well. There are a few questions that are coming up as well, but I guess my big focus is considering that IAPS is an international association of political science students, we wanna focus on education. What do you think the colleges and organizations like ours can be doing to promote knowledge sharing? Uh, start your own class. It's like uh, to uh, get the mentality and guts to convince your class and your teacher to, to, teach to do something for your own university or applied science. It's uh, You can also try to convince others, but first of all, you need a mem uh, people around you who want to cooperate. And uh, it's not really easy to organize uh, a really important project without any uh, cooperation and stakeholders. So try to develop uh, and convince uh, classes around you to prepare a competition in your own school about space. You get already something going off. And if all the universities like that, you can eventually start this competition uh, once a year for older schools, maybe, and convince space agencies to send some jury members like we did uh, with our NASA hackathon. I, I think it's that. also just incredibly vital to put space into education. And uh, well, ideally, I think you should even start earlier on a primary school level to just give that spark and that awe. And it can be very easy. I mean, it's just introducing like those kind of elements, like like a documentary about the overview effect, just to get people thinking and to to spark that curiosity as well. So you can reach out and find more information. And I think at a certain point, we have to really think about including it space and in space education more into 
general curriculums because it is part of our world that we live in. That's really important too. And I guess one question that really comes up for me personally is what about the gender balance? Do you see that there's a gender balance in space politics research and stuff, especially for you as a woman that's getting involved with this, Kiara? I think I do see a development that it is becoming more diverse, but uh, yeah, on the base level, I think it is, yeah, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, especially on, on the politics side of things. It's still uh, a lot of white males <laughs> dominating that sector, <laughs> but I do, see, I do see a lot of development, especially also talking to a lot of people who are getting into the space sector. There's a lot of, like, a lot of diversity happening right now. Yes, and to give more uh, uh, be good boost uh, for now, UNOS have developed since uh, last year Space for Women platform. So they're collecting each year really nice leaders. So if you find yourself really good uh, to give the message, you can find it on UNOSA Space for Women, and you can uh, apply and you will be like a coach or mentor for others. And uh, they are doing really nice ideas around the world. So one of, uh, of them is uh, from uh, Germany and have developed a really nice uh, program called Space, uh, Space for Women Show. She's doing each week a really nice uh, discussion session about topics with uh, not only women, but also with some men specialists. And it's each week. So you can find it on Facebook. Uh, they are live streaming it always. And you can check it back uh, and even a lot of websites. They, so if you start with researching and get the chances, you will be uh, have enough information for your whole life. So try beside of one to, uh, uh, to check everything. Also request and recheck for what topic because uh, eventually you will get so much of nice discussions about like space law, SDGs and this kind of thing, but it's, it's need to be compared with your own, own interest because you cannot always listen to the same people for uh, your whole life. You need to be concrete and you need to make choices. So uh, there, are, there are a lot, but uh, they are not uh, uh, well informed around the world. There are chances for it, but uh, we believe, and I, I'm not saying for myself, but we believe surely that if, if it will be good shared by the, uh, by the government, by the universities, by the schools, by the uh, uh, organizations, and more of it, it will be. And it will be sure, because if you see how much of uh, uh, NASA and ASA investing their budget in commercial parts and promoting to inform the citizens. I surely believe in the coming uh, coming year or coming month, it will be going more, more and more. So uh, we, we as uh, young people and citizens of our own planet, besides of being young astronauts, we can call ourselves also spacepreneurs or space influencers. Uh, and if you're interested, we can help you with it. <laughs> That's amazing. Because one thing that we've been talking about at IAPS is how we can contribute to the discourse. And I know that you're mentioning a lot of different resources that we personally did not know existed. So I guess one question that I have is how can we uh, contribute to this discourse? Because what's missing? Where do we start? How can different sectors, because you're talking about partnerships, how can people from the academic side begin to approach this? Well, uh, uh, sorry if I added more, but I also want to give Kiara and Jakob a chance. Uh, it's uh, starting with your own bubble because uh, many people are not uh, feeling well and also will not choose to go uh, to, uh, to a place that they don't know, to people that they don't know. So first it's really important that they uh, convinced that they ha have enough from their own bubble. So they uh, want to learn from others. So try to convince your own mindset and your own mentality to go further than your own um, uh, experience uh, places that you had in your life. I think what is also adding on to what Alexander says and that, that bubble, the very vital thing that is missing from this discourse is the actual discourse also between sectors. Because 
what what we have found out is the space industry and the space sector is very open, but at the same time also very much caught up with on their within their own bubble. Whereas all these issues that we are facing and all these opportunities that we have are on so many different levels and require a lot more collaboration and a lot more communication between them as well. So to actually help this discourse is to help connect different sectors and different communities to talking about this and to developing some well, amazing solutions and, and working with the data and the technology we have at our disposal. Right. Um, so on the subject of policy, maybe let's talk about um, SDG 18 in particular, because I know there's been a bunch of progress to um, kind of make this a formal SDG, but I guess, so maybe more for Chiara, but um, so what, what progress has been made so far and kind of what are the next steps to um, kind of really institutionalize this as a part of the um, kind of international mandate? Maybe before, Chiara, can I? Just uh, before uh, Chiara will uh, get totally involved, I wanted to just uh, add that basically when uh, we will uh, be developing, uh, actually we took first steps into making SDG uh, 18 of official part of sustainable development agenda uh, by uh, starting progress uh, with starting a, a project together with UNMGCY, so United Nations Major Group of Children and Youth, and uh, uh, we are planning on creating a uh, uh, space uh, a youth council uh, that would be adjacent to uh, relevant UN bodies, so here UNOSA, and to UNMGCY. Young people will be able to influence politics and different decision makers uh, that are involved uh, themselves into space and possibly uh, through that, you can also uh, influence major UN body like Economical Social Committee uh, and to uh, start making space politics and space affairs more mainstream issue because there's a lot of things that need to be done and the rule of law needs to be brought uh, to outer space because let's say there are big problems concerning uh, the usage of outer space for commercial reasons there is not really much said of no, about that, what can be done or what people want to do. Elon Musk has a lot of different plans with his uh, moon base, but this is the talk for later. And now I will let Chiara take over. Thank you, Jacob. I mean, I think what uh, Jacob has said is a very vital step that we are taking on creating this, this youth advisory group to really also again get that awareness there and make sure that it's understood why this is such a priority and why this is also such a necessity. Uh, when it comes to the process of the SDG 18 action, what we have realized with uh, talking to the UN is that they do not really see that this the current SDG agenda is an open one. So we are advocating for an SDG 18, but it is more likely that it will be work towards putting space on the agenda on the new agenda, which will be created in 2030. Uh, but what we are working on and what I mentioned in my presentation at the beginning is this set of targets and indicators to make sure that it's very clear and very measurable of what we are trying to achieve and how. And this list, this creation of this list involves all different kinds of stakeholders. So we're reaching out to people from very different fields and getting a lot of input on this to make sure that it is fully supported by the whole community. And at the same time, we're just trying to advocate more for the need of an SDG 18, or at least some form of having space on the global agenda. Because a lot of people don't really recognize that importance at first, but when explained, they realize how important it actually is. So building up that support and working on having very specific measures that will lead us to our hopefully next step of really discussing how to get it on the agenda. All right, so um, I guess the next question sort of branches off in terms of how this can be applied um, in an academic context. So what is kind of missing, do you think, in the current discourse on space politics, perhaps in political science? And is, is there anything that you would recommend in terms of you know, space politics research that you would like to see in the next, um, within the next decade or so? Okay. As Alex, do you want to? 
Okay. Uh, I only want to add uh, to give more stages. You know, TEDx, maybe to organize more TEDx uh, NASA, TEDx issue, TEDx ASA, to give stages, not only for the current professionals, but people with good ideas. Because if you share it, people will also be more comfortable. Because if you, uh, if you have mentality of, yes, uh, we have really smart engineers for it, they will not listen to us, is already a, a bad warning. So it's better to give the chance uh, and uh, it will be happened. I believe that uh, space agencies want to give chances around them. So uh, uh, a, a stage, a stage that they can speak with each other, communicate with each other and work with each other. Uh, Jacob. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Alex. So um, definitely I would say raising awareness is definitely something that uh, needs to be done as the first thing because there is no there is a lot of overlap in space technologies and biodiversity uh, agriculture there's a lot of things uh, that have potential for overlap also including political mm. science but as a person who studied political science and you know, international law i can definitely say that everything is you know, very much content compartmentalized Okay, well, you know what I mean. Everything is in their own little bubbles and people do not communicate with each other. Right now, space technologies and space affairs are dominated by people who are engineers, astronauts. Well, uh, everything is basically monopolized by the states and uh, their proprietary uh, agencies. The space sector uh, from the private uh, 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 sector is just taking off. Right now we have maybe three or four companies that are working on international scale, but soon, sooner or later we'll, it will start taking over. So probably by the next development goals that we will have around 2030, uh, uh, space will be included as one of the major points of contention between uh, different issues. And for example, the very basic thing that needs to be defined is what is outer space because in terms of international law or political science, nothing is uh, defining that what is outer space, where it starts, where is the you know, Earth atmosphere ends, and where is uh, uh, Earth's orbit. So this, from the point of uh, uh, legal scholars, is something that should be defined, uh, pretty much like with the Treaty of Arctic that we have. We have defined what is Arctic and what we can do with Arctic. Well, we have defined in the Treaty of Outer Space uh, what is, uh, no, sorry, what we can do in the outer space uh, from the basic reasons, but we haven't really done anything in uh, terms to say what is outer space, how we should protect, say, biodiversity on other planets if we find life over there, or you know, how we can uh, use the uh, resources of other celestial bodies uh, for commercial reasons. So uh, around the time when 2030 will kick in and hopefully the climate change will not eat us, then uh, we will have to know, uh, start thinking about exploring outer space for resources because we are already running short on uh, uh, resources each single year. I think for this year, we already run out of resources on 21st of August. So day over should day changes every single year. I believe in like 1970s, that was barely a problem because well, day over should day was somewhere in uh, uh, December. I think it was 27 or 26th no, of December. Nowadays, it's somewhere in the half of the year. So with growing population and uh, uh, a raised uh, standard of living for you know, people who are elevated from poverty across the world, this is something that we will have to think in terms of competition and uh, uh, how we will prevent as scholars, as people who are doing university, uh, uh, to prevent another Wild Wild West scenario when we will have freaking space pirates. We definitely don't want this sort of thing. So definitely we need to bring some sort of law and order into outer space. And uh, another important thing what we can do uh, is talk with your professors because a lot of our of our professors have some passion and interest for that, but uh, they are afraid to engage into that because academia itself is also a very rigid uh, thing. So start small with your club, friends, 
as a student association, then eventually you will get connected with people who are interested into that because uh, law of attraction basically says that if you want to do something, sooner or later, no, this thing will happen to you. I remember speaking with a friend of mine four years ago that I want to get involved into outer space at first, but I don't know where to start. So eventually, a couple of years later, I met Alex, Chiara, and a couple of other people, and we started working on different projects. So definitely there's not much problem over here. Plus, my university is offering uh, an elective in uh, 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 European law. You can choose uh, introduction to you know, space law as one of the courses that you can take. So definitely there are you know, venues where you can start being passionate. Also, if somebody wants, I can recommend the entire you know, library of different uh, books on you know, space law and international politics and how to mainstream that thing into the future. Okay, so to build off of the point on um, kind of the law and kind of peace in space, we kind of noticed that a number of countries have been trying to expand their influence, um, you know, in space, right, develop new initiatives and things like that. So I guess, what are your thoughts on kind of a path to, to kind of peace in space? I know you mentioned various treaties, and maybe would you be able to maybe outline some examples of what various countries have been doing um, to you know, to, to, to develop a presence, right? And in particular, um, we, I know a lot of our viewers right now are, are from Africa on the stream here. So maybe are there any examples of um, space exploration um, coming from Africa that you might want to, to, to mention? Uh, also, for my side, uh, a message, uh, start with your own uh, environment, because I know there are a lot of also projects from space focused on Africa. Uh, if you also uh, acknowledge uh, uh, the coming future, because I know there was last a uh, uh, Chinese-Russian summit out Africa, so a lot of countries are still really interested to cooperate. So. Uh, besides of waiting and uh, know that there will be coming countries to engage, uh, try to engage yourself with uh, possibilities. And if you cannot find it around you, try to uh, ask uh, better internet or trying to uh, exchange yourself in possibilities to get the knowledge from books. Uh, because uh, one of the greatest things that you can still use are books. Uh, some books are re so really nice. You if you can acknowledge yourself with fast reading, fast uh, expectation, you can also understand more difficult discussions that you experience from uh, people who uh, who comes who comes to visit. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, okay. Jacob, do you have some? Yeah, I have something to add. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so, Patrick. Uh when we are talking about space exploration in Africa, there are a lot of interesting projects that are being developed right now on agriculture in Nigeria and Ethiopia. Because well, say uh, Ethiopia right now is building their no, no, no big, no, what is it? The great uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. They are building this thing and it causes a lot of conflict uh, between uh, no, no neighboring countries with Ethiopia. So there is a lot of uh, tension between Sudan, Egypt, uh, uh, no, and uh, other countries over there. But uh, sp uh, satellites are helping to track like the river flows and to uh, no, help preventing the data that will be analyzed uh, from the satellites will eventually help into signing some sort of treaty that will regulate the usage of this dam and uh, the flows from the Nile uh, from Ethiopia uh, to Egypt, because Egypt, as uh, the country with over 100 million people, is very dependent on the flows from the Nile because uh, the climate over there happens not to be the most habitable, so to say. And uh, there is a very amazing project uh, that is run in Nigeria currently. I forgot who is doing that personally, but uh, there are people who are using space technologies uh, to measure uh, the fertility of the land. And also you know, they are measuring uh, different fields by uh, placing GPS markers 
Uh, so that helps them not only uh, to measure the field, but also output of the crop and uh, prevent uh, possible uh, famines. Because if you see uh, different plagues coming your way, you can also you know, see that away from the satellite, so it's easier to actually do some crisis management. So there's a lot of interesting projects that are you know, happening in terms of using space tech and uh, you know, developing stuff on the ground. Here in, let's call it developed world, we are not really accustomed to using these tools, but I see that in Africa, in India, in Latin America, there are some different projects that are helping uh, with using space tech to protect the biodiversity and environment. Uh, there's also a very big project uh, uh, from uh, uh, with usage of uh, space technology that protects uh, rainforest in Amazon from uh, illegal logging and uh, uh, people putting their cattle on or you know, when they are kicking out indigenous people, there is a lot of space you know, satellites just around that region of the world that are you know, tracking uh, everything in the life. So you can always know who is doing what. And so uh, let's be honest, the spy satellites or the communication satellites that we can use right now uh, are pretty insane. Uh, a lot of satellites use the same cameras as our phones, but you then you have like thousands of them uh, put together. So the uh, quality of the zoom allows you to see a you know, small box of matches with very high definition you know, resolution, which you can do. So I would say space technology is always useful here and there, and you can find something you know, quite cool if you just look closely around. Okay, so we just have a few more questions here. So the first one's kind of a follow up on um, the previous one. So I know that a lot of countries have, um, you know, varying levels of, of ability to fund space initiatives and also a lot of current crises like COVID-19 have kind of affected their ability to maybe, you know, fund space um, exploration or even kind of get started. So, you know, what would you recommend um, for these countries who are maybe having a bit of difficulty um, developing, I guess, guess the funding and maybe getting started, um, would you see it more of, um, would you favor like maybe a more collaborative international approach or would you think that these countries should maybe try to develop their own kind of um, national initiatives? Um, for my side, uh, they can try to find organization and youth communities, youth organizations, who uh, already doing current topics because uh, they may be already doing some things, but space is indeed too difficult sometimes to discuss, but uh, to request to the organization for getting knowledge or getting uh, a possibility for a session or for a workshop, because uh, they already uh, so much things freely. It's only having internet and uh, having a group of people who are interested in that way. So uh, beside of uh, your questions, try to find people who are interested because if you have a group, you will be not uh, forgetting it faster. Because if you, you, had, uh, you have a group, thanks to that, to have uh, mentality issues of it. I think the other thing to consider, and that is also something I mentioned before as well, when it comes to, to countries who are maybe uh, struggling a bit more when it comes to, to budgeting or when it comes to also facing other problems, is to create that link between what they are facing right now and how space could possibly help them. Because there is a lot of possibilities out there, but of course, if you are in a dire situation right now, this is not maybe the first thing you will think about. Also the general public will probably not be thinking about that first. They will see like, okay, we, our top priority is to ensure our safety rather than expanding to space. So by, by fostering that capacity building and, and also helping these countries with, with the knowledge that is there, they can also make a lot more out of their situations because the, there's much more of a connection between what they're facing and how space technology and data can help. And that will then also help them to make that step to expand to that industry, but there has to be much more of a link to what they are facing currently. Okay, well, thank you. And so our next question, or we're gonna probably gonna combine it into one, but um, 
It's a bit more of a fun one. So based on our initial comments, I know some of our viewers have kind of been waiting for this one for the whole time. But uh, so we noticed that, um, you know, in some countries, there appear to be initiatives that are a bit more secretive that may or may not involve um, space exploration, space security. Um, I know one example that um, probably popped up in the comments was, you know, Area 51 and stuff. Um, and also we've had comments about questions about extraterrestrial life. So do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I guess, are these kinds of initiatives um, that might not be a, as open to the public? Um, are they beneficial for this kind of space politics discourse? Um, how does it affect things? And um, yeah, feel feel free to I know it's a bit of a rabbit hole, but um, I'm going to leave it open to you. So um, whoever, whoever would like to go first, feel free to jump in. I suppose somebody has to do it. So let me be the nut job. I forgot my tinfoil. My friends from Uranus actually uh, left it uh, with them when they were doing some probing last time. So I am not uh, going to go into details with that. But uh, basically, when we are talking about RIA 51, this is just uh, according to some conspiracy theories and also people who like to watch Joe Rogan. Uh, this is just the tip of uh, an iceberg. We have plenty of crazy SBRs that say that moon is hollow, the earth is hollow, there are some underground cities uh, uh, here and there. Uh, uh, I believe like one of the more secretive uh, things that I've heard is Dulce Base, which is like the complex of underground tunnels under Cheyenne Mountain. Uh, which uh, is uh, full of aliens, extraterrestrials, and so on. So uh, we are uh, going here into the territory of very, very deep uh, conserva uh, sorry, uh, conspiracy theories. But what we can add over here is that also Russians uh, have a lot of research on UFO that is completely secretive. And uh, we may say that RIA 51, where they are testing with new proportion systems, is a very uh, uh, spicy topic, but I would look actually outside of US uh, what's happening in Russia and China in terms of uh, searching for extraterrestrial life. But uh, to be serious or end on a serious note, I would say you know, I do not expect personally that we will find intelligent life within our lifetime. Probably we will find some bacteria on Mars or remains of bacteria from that period of time because space is relatively huge and uh, traveling relativistic distances is something that is insane. And I do not expect that we will have first contact coming somewhere in our lifetime unless uh, Vulcans are somewhere and they will come and live long and prosper. So I guess um, as one of the final top, final questions of our formal panel, um, where do we go to get some information? Because we're starting to see a lot of uh, fake news about space. Somebody posted yesterday that um, there are aliens that are watching us from the stars. And so obviously there's a lot of misinformation about space. Where can you go for some reliable information about this, these topics? Space agencies. <laughs> Um, besides of the agencies, uh, you can also uh, speak with journalists, speak with people who are working there because uh, they write the articles, they write the blogs. So instead of only accepting what you can find on social media, you can engage the, with the people who are writing these uh, things. And that is also making easier to see if it's fake news or uh, fair, uh, fair realistic news because if you are, uh, if you find out that the article of information that you find out is written by a, 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 a boat drunk person who is not interested at all and just uh, giving a, a, a shout out outside of its own building you already know to whom you should listen to so try to find out if you find information the information behind it not only the topics but also who have written it <laughs> and and asking him the question to see if it's uh, not realistic or realistic topic that you want to know <laughs>
Yeah, I think what Alexander is right, but that is with any kind of news, you should uh, triangulate and you should not just listen to one source, but really see what is out there and actively look and compare. Uh, because, yeah, if you just follow one source, you run the risk of believing something that might not be 100% the truth. I will run over here a slightly different angle. Uh, I remember the uh, link that you uh, passed to Trevor yesterday. And uh, it was saying that there are probably 1,000 alien civilizations that are watching uh, Earth. And uh, if we would go by what Nikola Tesla was saying uh, a century ago, uh, he was able to detect some weird signals and he was able uh, to say that he was talking with aliens. And if we know anything about Nikola Tesla, this guy was uh, probably the smartest person who lived in the last century. So if he says that he was talking with aliens, maybe there is a possibility that we have aliens, but who knows? Honestly, I never seen alien in my life. I've never seen even UFO. And I am still curious what is hiding in Area 51. So I would just say uh, when it comes to uh, aliens detecting us, it's quite possible because we as a civilization, we are broadcasting a lot of radio signals but those radio signals that are leaving Earth, they are going at speed of light. So there is only as much of uh, a signal that they can reach uh, will be pretty much outdated because uh, say if we are broadcasting something in the radius of maximum 300 light years, when something will reach aliens for like say 50 light years away, we will not really able, they will not be able to communicate with us because so uh, they will watch some stuff that already happened 50 years ago. So probably they will be somewhere at the, the beginning of uh, Korean War. And they will think that this is what is currently happening on Earth. But uh, then also we have some amazing technology that is able to detect, uh, uh, say, you know, radar signals or different type of signals uh, as far as uh, 25,000 light years if they happen to be directed at Earth. So if there is some alien aircraft flying somewhere on the planet far, far away, and it is using like a radio no, no signals, surely we can detect that, but we have to be very lucky because space is big unknown and we will never be able to you know, surely quantify what is hiding over there, what is over there not. We are just people flying on a spaceship that is a piece of rock around some big star that is circulating around a giant hole in the space with other thousands of different uh, uh, hot uh, nuclear uh, reactors that we call stars. So this is where I would want to finish this. Earth is the biggest UFO out there. All right. <laughs> so. Um... Yeah, thank you so much for that one. Um, I think we definitely end this on, on, on an, inter an interesting note for sure. Uh, I think at this point, we're just going to um, kind of share some opportunities that are coming up um, or that, you know, folks watching might be interested in. The first is that, you know, as the International Association for Political Science Students is um, a student government, um, you're all, you, you know, you're able to sign up um, to become a member so you can have voting rights and, um, and participate in uh, in our elections and stuff, right? Um, especially if your school isn't already affiliated with uh, with IEPS. So definitely encourage that. Um, if you need more information, we could perhaps um, you know post a, a link maybe in in the comments there, or we can um, you can just go to IEPS.org and uh, yeah, we'll definitely uh, definitely encourage that. In addition. Um, so the UN 75 has a survey that uh, we've been sharing to, um, you know, get, get some feedback um, on what you think about the SDGs. So it might be good to, um, if you're passionate about space politics and want to make SDG 18 a reality, it might be good to like leave a note in that survey in the comments portion of that to say, um, hey, we should maybe include um, some space stuff in there. So absolutely, uh, definitely recommend that we can maybe share a link in the comments for, for that what one. What we're going to well. do is there are specific questions that we need to address in there. And I feel like a lot of our panelists touched on these, so we're not going to ask them to um, repeat them. But in the comments below, if you guys can answer some of these things so we can include it in our UN75 uh, 
consultation report. Here are the main questions. One, what should the international community prioritize to recover better from recover and build back better from the pandemic? And how does that apply to space? Like how can they build back better after the pandemic and promote multilateralism in space? So that's the first one. If you need me to repeat that, I will do that super quick. What should the international community prioritize to recover and build back better from the pandemic and promote multilateralism in space? So obviously that's not the exact question, but we are repurposing it for this particular consultation. Um, the next one is if you want to picture the world that you want in 25 years, what three things would you most want to see? So in 25 years, what do you picture in what do you picture in the world and how can it be better in 2045? Uh, which what global trends do you think will most affect our future? So what how what issues are going to be the most relevant in 2045 and one of the options actually is cyber warfare so you can talk about that a little bit um and you can relate some of the topics that we've discussed today to the other sdgs as our panelists have so um eloquently done and the other ones are how important is it or not for countries to work together to manage some of these issues why does multilateralism matter and what how much does that matter to you personally has COVID-19 changed your views on cooperation between countries? So how has the pandemic really impacted your own perception of multilateralism? And do you think that people in 2045 will be better or worse off than you are today? And finally, what would you advise the Secretary General to do to address these global trends? What do you think that the UN can be doing better? What do you think that countries can be doing better to promote uh, more dialogues on space exploration. So in the chats, please, please, please tell us what you think. If you can also indicate your country and your age as well, we would love to have that for our own records as we compile this report. We know that we have such a diverse audience and it's really important for us to ensure that all of you are included. Now, one last thing before we wrap up is that the International Association of Political Science Students is always welcoming members. Some of you in the chat have asked how you can get in touch with our panelists. And that's very easy. You can join IAPS and continue to work with us. Because Justin, would you like to make the big announcement? Yeah, so IAPS is currently um, in the process of uh, exploring the possibility of developing a new student research committee focused on um, space politics, right? So. In future years, we can ensure that um, kind of discourse and research on this topic can, um, can be advanced to, to kind of help um, both SDG 18 uh, and, and beyond, right? Uh, so if you're interested in that, um, please uh, stay tuned on, and just keep a tabs on our social media and stuff because we'll definitely have um, a bit more, more to share about that soon. So yeah, definitely um, very exciting. And if you're interested in maybe, you know, just student research committees are sort of like um, academic subsections, right? So we have various subsections of political science where students can kind of come together, discuss the topic, and in some cases publish, um, uh, you know, essays or um, produce kind of webinars, kind of videos like this one as well. So definitely lots of um, opportunities to get involved and, uh, and to kind of get started on, on maybe a larger academic journey. So. And yeah. it's important to know that we also have regional teams. So we've discussed a lot of different uh, subtopics on space exploration and how it affects different areas and how it affects different regions. So this student research committee is part of the global team, but that doesn't necessarily preclude you from continuing to work with our different regional teams to discuss opportunities and think about ways that you guys can incorporate programming in your own countries. We're very open in that sense. Uh, also, you are welcome to contribute research on any topic uh, to any of our research committees, which you can find on our website, iapps.org. Become a member and we can talk to you about some ways that you can continue to promote research in general. All right. So I guess on that note, um, maybe if anyone um, has some concluding thoughts, maybe you'd like to promote um, some of your own initiatives as well. Uh, I'm going to hand the floor over to our, to our speakers once more. Well, to, uh, we have already discussed, but uh, Chiara, SDG 8, uh, Space for All, 
and our initiative space uh, space planners we are trying to engage but at the same time we preparing a really nice un level body proposition to connect uh, a youth engagement with inosa and united nations so we uh, we've already got the message that we can inform about it so if you as an individual or as an organization want to be involved let us know because our proposal will be rechecked uh, coming uh, friday so ne uh, so next week friday uh, with 50 coordinators and we seriously want to acknowledge with our big launch with our own website with our own uh, 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 chance not only by our own but also who wants to share it. so you have the luck to be involved by the first step but we always will be open uh, a train will sometimes stop for people who wants to jump in not uh, non-stop traveling so this is for my side Uh, Jacob, do um, you have something or not? <laughs> all right. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, for that um, and for for you know for for sharing this um, these great insights with us. And we look forward to um, you know future collaborations. And um, I'm sure that the you know the space, space politics student research committee would definitely benefit um, from the involvement of the, of the three of you here. So uh yeah and so thank you also to all to, to rory um for um co-hosting this and uh, helping with the organization and also for uh all the viewers from around the world here who are who are watching this and um for for supporting iops we definitely um, appreciate um all that you do and um we hope to have lots more uh, fun exciting things uh for you to look forward to um, so thank you so much and uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. And join IAPS. Like <laughs> I said, we will be continuing these discussions. We're not done yet, although we are done with this particular webinar. So stay tuned for more information. Okay, well, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Live long bye -bye. and prosper.